we have to stop telling them you are either American or Muslim. And we hear it even from the larger community. Oh, you are a Muslim, but you are a good guy. I shouldn't be you are a Muslim, but you are a Muslim and you are a good guy. Or because you are a Muslim, you are a good guy. And that's the narrative that your generation, my generation have to work on. That right. because I am a Muslim, I am a good guy. And studies have shown that if you have a Muslim neighbor, that means very likely your whole neighborhood is safer than otherwise. Right? Wow, yeah. And and this is this is actually pure research that has been done and you know and things uh, things to that effect. I just want to highlight also that I think my generation struggling a little bit with the identity part more than you you would think. 75 to 80% of next generation or now first generation Muslims, the the American Muslims do not go to established institutions that are Islamic. 75 to 80% of me, basically me, do not go to the mosques or the MSAs or any of that stuff. Why? Why is that? Uh, I think. Well, uh, yeah, so that that's a really actually great question, and that is a question that uh, a lot of people have tried to do research on, and a lot of us have tried to understand. And a lot of us, um, uh, there are multiple reasons. Number one is it's a sign of the times. Uh, what do I mean? America is a very individualistic society. It's you and you decide what you want to do. And therefore, you will see that um, people in general, they say, well, you know what, I can get my spirituality through YouTube. I can get my spirituality through Snapchat or Instagram, or I can follow my favorite, um, you know, uh, speaker or imam, priest, you know, a Muslim priest or, uh, or imam, as we call them, the leader uh, or scholar, even if they live in South Africa. I have direct access to them that I don't have to go to my local mosque per se. The number two is the mosque uh, has struggled to satisfy the need of our youth. It hasn't kept up with the needs of our youth and that is really the onus is on us to make it a welcoming space, to make it a welcoming place. It uh, seems like the mosque here is established in the way it is in the Middle East and in and in Muslim countries, which is to uphold the laws and institutions of Islam. But here I think we need a different form of mosque mentality. Well, if you look actually at the, at the prophetic model of the mosque, was the mosque was the center of the community. I mean, that's oh. where people used to live. That's where people, uh, there are even, uh, you know, uh, the people used to play games in the mosque. And, people used to wrestle? Uh, people used to wrestle. People used to throw, you know, um, uh, their uh, archeries in the mosque. People used to uh, meet in the mosques. People used to trade. In, I mean, like you name it, people used to do a lot of things in the mosque. Um, and unfortunately, through the generations and really more the recent couple hundred years, where the mosque took onto just the place for prayer and a place of solace. And I just come and I pray and it's a very sterile environment and I leave. And not only that, but if you're not doing that, then you're going to get yelled at. If you do wrestle, if you do play, if you do talk, you're getting yelled at. That's right. Right. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, you know, if you look at the churches, many of my friends will say, well, if you go to the church, you can hear a pin drop. And... I have a problem with that. I have a problem that you should never hear a pin drop because the mosque of the prophet was described as a beehive. It was always busy. There's always noise. There are always people. There's always this. There's a life that is going on. So we have to bring life to the mosque itself. And how do we bring life to the mosque itself? By giving space, by opening space, by understanding. Um, who goes to the hospital, right? If, you know, who usually would go to the hospital? Those in need. Those in need. Who usually goes to the mosque? Those in need. That's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> we are all in need of God's mercy. We're all in need of getting close to him. But anyone who goes out of their way to go to an Islamic institution is clearly seeking something. Yes. yes. And that's why it has to be welcoming, right? Yes. As we tell people, come as you are to Islam as it is, right? So there are certain things that we cannot compromise. That is that is a beautiful... I've never heard that one. So Can you say that again? Come as you are to Islam as it is. Okay. Basically, what does that mean? We have a 
person who came, he was completely ignorant of what the teachings of Islam, but he loved, he loved God, he loved his prophet. He came into the mosque of the prophet and he peed in the middle of the, you know, the mosque. They were about to kill him. Well, they, they, they were, they were hushing him, him and they were, exactly. And the prophet stopped them. Yeah. He said, no, 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 you stop, not him. It's okay. Let me teach him a little bit. And then the person, you know, had, had said beautiful things about the prophet afterwards because he showed, he saw the mercy. The prophet accepted him and empowered him and gave him the chance and the choice. And he, he chose wisely and he chose rightly. Imagine uh, another if someone, man, another so. companion of the prophet, he would come to the prayer drunk. And people are shocked. This is why, actually, there is a verse in the Quran, Ya ladina amanu, la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. Oh, who you believe, do not come to prayer while you are intoxicated. That was actually the very first verse about us not getting drinking. And then little by little, we were weaned off and said, okay, now you cannot really drink. But even after those verses were revealed at the time of the prophet, there were very famous companions that still had problems with drinking. What's a companion? A friend of the prophet, a right? A friend of the prophet. Somebody who came to the prophet, somebody, and the person was actually beloved by the prophet, and he made the prophet laugh all the time. He was a joker. And right? they loved the prophet, and the prophet and, loved them. And then somebody actually came and... You know, they, he was receiving a punishment for being a drunkard at the time of the prophet. And somebody cursed that companion. And the prophet said, don't ever curse him, for I know he loves the prophet and he loves God. Right? So the prophet loved him back. He's not perfect, but the prophet loved him. Uh, other people who committed, uh, you know, adultery. Oh, prophet, I committed adultery. Oh, prophet, he said, you know, he turns away from him. What's adultery? Adultery is fornication. Basically, you know, sex outside of marriage. Sex outside of wedlock. Okay. And the prophet still accepts him. And the prophet is still merciful to him. And this, the prophet is still loving to him. That doesn't mean he agreed with what that person is doing. But he still saw an amazing deal of goodness in that person and that that person is a vital member of his community. And I think it's really important not to throw the baby with the bathwater. None of us is perfect. And one of the greatest problems uh, is, uh, and there's actually a great saying which says, a sin that humbles you in the front of God is much better than a ritual that makes you arrogant in the front of God and feeling haughty, look how good I am of a servant. Because God wants a humility. He doesn't want self-righteousness. He does not want a spiritual, you know, club that comes to the mosque and, oh, feel good about yourselves. Oh, you're you, you are such a good Muslim because I always see you praying. It's a good thing that you pray. And alhamdulillah, praise be to God that we do join each other in prayer and we build a community and whatnot. But God accepted all of us. Right. And what, what, what's interesting is that a lot of people try to paint the actions of the prophet, peace be upon him, as these holy actions that no one can repeat. When in reality, the prophet was described by his wife as a walking Quran, right? Which is someone who is implementing the Quran every second and every day. Him going out of his way to make sure that these men don't yell at the, that guy and that he doesn't get yelled at for peeing in the masjid. That's Quran. That's Islamic. That's not him being just prophetic and oh, this is his character. But when I see someone pee in the in the masjid, then I have to be angry. It's like yep. no, no, no. You thinking that you're you know standing up for Islam by yelling at the man peeing in the mosque is actually hurting Islam because that man is going to leave that mosque saying these Muslims are mean, they're vile, they're hurtful. Rather than him taking on that beautiful, yeah. you know, representation of Islam that yeah. that guy did. Yeah. And uh, it, it's important to recognize, you know, that there are a lot of things that we may disagree with. And there are things that, you know, that people do because they are people. And they may not be the most wholesome things that they do. But it's really important. And there's a saying that says, you know, hate the sin, not the sinner. Right. Reprimand the sinner. Correct the sinner. Advise the sinner. Admonish the sinner. Help the sinner. Do whatever you want, but it has to be out of concern and out of love. It shouldn't be out of uh, smite or it shouldn't be out of hatred. It shouldn't be out of like, you Most know. Most people do it out of wanting their narrative and the way they were raised to be implemented and seen everywhere they go. 
a lot of people that are, for example, have been hijabi for their whole life. I don't want to go for the woman, the sisters, because they're amazing. They they're the best part of our community in America. But for example, a girl that uh, doesn't wear the hijab, right? While versus another girl that's always wearing the hijab. Hijab is the scarf that the woman wear around their head. You are not being helpful by judging her for not wearing the hijab. She's not a bad person for doing so. You should you should be helping her. And, and even if you can't help them put on the hijab because they're not ready yet. You know, just like the prophet's wife said, uh, and if God would have banned alcohol in the beginning of Islam, we would have never left alcohol. So if you were trying to ban you know, her, her hair being shown, she may never put on the hijab. So you just have to befriend them. Just being friends with someone is enough to make them turn back to God. I think it's really important to understand the difference between knowledge and application of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, do we believe that uh, the headscarf is obligatory? Yes, we do. Of course. Do we believe that salah is obligatory? Of course we do. Um, do I say to somebody who doesn't pray, you're going to go to hell? No. Do I believe that, you know, do I say to somebody who doesn't wear the hijab, oh, you're doomed forever? No. Um, all of us have challenges. And all of us are better than others in something, and we are worse than others in something else. Um, and I think it's not that we're condoning people's behavior or, you know, but it's really important to accept them and to help them on their path as they also will help us. I have worked with so many sisters who are not hijabis. Uh, I still do. And they come to my halaqas and whatnot. And they're great. And they're great they happen people. to be incredibly devout. They happen to be incredibly, uh, you know, uh, some of the most beautiful human beings and some of the most compassionate and always eager to help, always eager to volunteer and whatnot. Uh, so uh, the goal of us, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the balance on the Day of Judgment, that our good deeds out, outweigh our bad deeds, right? And our strengths outweigh our shortcomings. And uh, some, and Allah is very generous that one small deed done with sincerity can wipe all of our shortcomings. So we never give up on the mercy of God. We never give up that God is not going to accept us, right? Um, and... If God is allowing somebody to come to the mosque, you know that God loves them. That's why he sent them to his house. And your job is not to judge them. Your job is to be the host. And what kind of a host do you want to be? God asks you to be the best of hosts. How do you be, be the best of hosts? You basically work with that person towards whatever is best for them. And at different times in our lives, we have to realize that at some points, some of us may not have been praying five times a day. So now that I have already corrected, you know, and I've been working and Allah has enabled me to pray five times a day, I look at somebody and say, oh, you're doomed because you don't pray five times a day. The Prophet's way, he said, نِعْمَ الرَّجُلُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ لَوْ كَانُوا يُقِيمُ اللَّيْلِ Right? He said, he would be the best of men, this gentleman Abdullah, had he practiced staying up you know, in prayer at night. He did not say, you don't pray at night, you still have deficiency in your faith, you still have a problems, you are never going to be one of the big ones. And he is from the Abadil, he was one of the, actually the most famous figures of Islam that we know today. But the Prophet didn't say, uh, you, you have problems. He said, what an amazing person he is. Had he done this just little thing. And guess what happened to that companion? He started doing he it. He started doing it. Mm. So there is that wisdom. The wisdom is who do I apply to what and where and how. Uh, I personally just, uh, you know, I like to uh, really give uh, incredible uh, regard and respect to the sisters. We have no idea what they go through, to no. be honest. Um, and I did not really appreciate it because I could pass for a Caucasian or Hispanic or many, uh, God knows what, depending on the... And I grew up, you know, in very elite institutions in the United States. So I never was necessarily by the big system. Uh, there were some incidents here and there where I was faced with racism and, you know, anti 
you know, uh, uh, Islamophobia and being called names, but those were very rare. For the vast majority of the time, I was one of the guys, if you want to call it. I go to a restaurant, yes, sir, can I help you, sir, and this and that. I go to anywhere, you, I'm being served. And I noticed a huge difference after I got married to a hijabi, to a woman that wears the headscarf. All of a sudden, I'm stopped. All of a sudden, the service goes down. All of a sudden, people are giving you looks. All of a sudden, people are calling you names. And I'm like, why no one calls me names, right? But when I am with my wife, who is visibly Muslim, all of a sudden, the treatment is completely different. So sometimes we, are, we sit on a pedestal as guys, and we say, oh, she's not wearing it. But we have no idea what name she has been called in the past. We have no idea if somebody walked after her at some point wanting to hurt her or she got scared or she got frightened or this. We don't understand the intimidation that they go through. We don't understand the insecure, insecurities that they go through. So we really ask Allah to strengthen them and help them. And they really do a better job at representing than we do just by even wearing this scarf. It's an incredible struggle an incredible, it takes, uh, you know, amazing strength for one of our sisters to put her headscarf as a minority here to make herself as visible Muslim. In the meanwhile, we guys, we are very happy to pass by as one of just the greater society and no one is judging us. Yeah. So we can't really have it that way. You have to sit in the position of that person to be able to have a clear idea of the struggles that they are going through before you judge them.